How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? What's the real truth about Citizen Kane? It'll probably turn out to be a very simple thing. Hey, everybody. I hope you're doing well. I'm Parker. I'm Max. And welcome back to another episode of Better Than Citizen Kane, the highly subjective show where you look at a movie and ask that titular question. Because when every movie ever made is a reasonable contender for the title of greatest film of all time, you have to wonder, Better Than Citizen Kane... So, grab your shovels and your nearest abnormal brain, because this week's experiment takes us all the way back to 1931 for James Whale's universal monster classic, Frankenstein. Woo-woo! Woo-woo, as they say. <laughs> as they say. Um, Parker, this is an interesting one, because neither of us really chose this one specifically. Like, it wasn't just mm-hmm. one of us. We kind of had a discussion. Yeah. We had something fall out of the schedule rather suddenly. Mm-hmm. And we were just like, eh, should we do this? Should we do this? And we were just kind of like, let's just do Frankenstein. Let's do Frankenstein. And if I remember correctly, a big part of our reasoning was just that this feels like such a turning point for horror cinema. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's the case in actual history? Or is that just the vibe that I presented? <laughs> no, very much so, I think. Oh, like, good. Especially after revisiting the movie and diving into some more research. Like, I think it was a good pick. Um Also, uh, don't think you're getting out of me ratting on you that Max really wanted to get representation from the 1930s in this year. And tell (laughs) the listeners why, Max. Why did you want to get the 30s in here? In covering Frankenstein this week, we, across this entire year, this season of Better Than Citizen Kane, if you will, we are covering a movie from each decade since the 1920s. Mm Mm-hmm. My apologies to D.W. Griffith. I don't want to cover your films. Boo to D.W. Anyway, that's the main, <laughs> that's the main <laughs> that's reason. The main, main Frankenstein reason came out in 31. I thought that was exciting to kind of get a, 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 you know, a representative from every decade of cinema. Totally. Minus those early two. Yeah, well. I mean, we could watch The Firefighter Goes to Work or whatever. <laughs> Again, I've been, I've been saying this. I think at some point we'll just do like three or four Georges Méliès shorts as a little yeah. package. You yeah, know? you know what? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think it'd be fun. Um... Great. So what's uh what's so this is a this is a horror kind of iconic mm-hmm. moment in horror history. Totally. From what I understand, this kind of saved Universal altogether. Yeah. Um, and when they realized, oh, we can print money with these, mm-hmm. that kind mm-hmm. of set off Universal Horror Universe, the yep. original Dark Universe, if you will, mm-hmm. and um, and that kind of established a huge chunk of horror history. Totally. And as you and I both are willing to admit. When a lot of, you know, members of the Academy potentially aren't. Mm-hmm. Horror is a huge part of why cinema is what it is. And Absolutely. like actively has been a huge kind of, you know, because in thinking about <laughs> since last year, I've been like, is it worth spending three or four weeks covering horror films on Better Than Citizen Kane? And then I go every time my brain goes, yes, absolutely. Stop it. Yeah. Because horror is so much a part of that and a part of like. Um, what's the word? Like the evolution of like techniques, even I feel like a lot of those things, I feel like I'm, you know what? It's early in the morning. I feel like I'm kind of talking out of my (laughs) ass a little bit. Parker, you take over. I feel like you're a, you're a film professor. You can say this much more eloquently (laughs) than I can. Yeah. So like to your point, like you're hitting all the major points and hitting them very well. You should be kinder to yourself. Um, uh, like it is like you can, you can track the entirety of, like film taste and film trends throughout history just by looking at horror movies. Like they are that omnipresent, they are that influential. Um, And, you know, a lot of the benchmarks of quote unquote proper cinema is usually dictated by people like the Academy. Like when we break it down, it's like, well, how many Oscars did this movie win? You know, what what kind of awards did it get? But honestly, like horror movies are 100% I think the poster child poster child for the argument of like pop culture being the end all be all of like, okay, what importance does a film have? Because literally we are in, you know, the year 2024 and we have an entire wing of a major theme park devoted to characters like these iterations of these characters yeah. from almost a hundred years ago. Like they have stuck around and are still you know, if we're, if we're breaking it down to pure capitalistic gain, they're still turning a profit, you know? Yeah. 
they are Absolutely. still entirely marketable. And that's, I, I can't say that for anything that, you know, existed in the 30s, I think. <laughs> For any anything at all no, that existed bulbs, in no, the 1930s. Not, not, not couldn't be. Not like the political no. happenings and goings on. Of course no. not. What really War? shaped the Never world. Heard of it. What really shaped the world was the universal horror monsters. I think so. Um I mean that's I don't know, Parker. That's kind of a hot take, but I will give you this that this did determine what a Frankenstein monster looked like mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. ever forever yep. and we're going to talk about that i have okay, so great. many things to say about that wow um okay so what's your history with frankenstein um when did you see this for the first time my history with frankenstein is uh probably when i was i know when i made my move so i i think i was maybe it's making moves yeah making moves um <laughs> i think i was maybe 11 or 12 and i you know liked halloween up to this point like all throughout my life and then i uh, being the awkward introverted little child that I was, um, I was like, Hey, I would really like to, I want to watch all the classic monster movies. Like I want to know like where all this comes from. And so I went to the library and I rented out like a stack of DVDs of these guys. Um, and just over the course of like a couple of weeks, just watched all of them. I watched, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Invisible Man, Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Mummy. Like I watched all of them. Um, and I had a lot of fun with them. Um, I thought I thought they were really interesting. Uh, I liked. Uh, this was probably one of my first like going out of my own way to watch like black and white films. Mm. I think this was probably. I'm sure I'd seen others growing up, but like as far as like seeking them out, this was kind of a first big foray for me. At interesting. A young age. Okay, so this was kind of like Young Barker's first foray into black and white mm-hmm. film. Totally. Wow, this is a huge part of that of that era of your life very much so yeah um and so uh this one in particular though was always one of my favorites um mostly because i thought it had i love the art direction of it like it was just great to look at um and also like it felt i don't know it's kind of like i don't know if you've experienced this or not but like when you finally watch you know these giant ur text movies and you're like oh this is what everything is referencing you know suddenly it all clicks kind of like what you talked about with like lawrence of arabia you're like oh we've just been doing lawrence of arabia over and over (laughs) again haven't we um like that's how it felt was like oh i get it like all every version of frankenstein i've ever seen in my life traces its roots back to this in film in theater on cereal boxes like it's all this you know um and that like that was very exciting for me when i was you know 11 i was like oh wow look i I found i found this you know covered in dust original document yeah you found like the sacred texts hidden under a rock somewhere exactly you were like wow Mm -hmm. um but that's that's kind of that's kind of my history with it what about you i saw this for the first time this last week (laughs) and and, and tell us about the emotional depths uh you experienced with all of that well you know it was a big start of my foray into black and white film (laughs) um no i mean yeah i think i caught bride of frankenstein for the first time a few weeks ago Mm. what a few years ago i should say i was like wow you just have have just been avoiding monster movies (laughs) i don't know man (laughs) but like a few years ago i caught bride of frankenstein And watching that, I was like, oh, interesting, because Mm -hmm. I read the novel in my sophomore year of high school, um, and I was like, wait, so if this part of the story is the sequel, I was like, what's in the first one? I guess it's like they just cut this out and saved it for the sequel. And also, Bride of Frankenstein was immensely disappointing to me because the bride was in it for the ending. And I feel like that's another example of just like, that image just lasting forever like immediately iconic and it's just wild that they were able to do that twice in monster designs Mm -hmm. um not discounting all the rest of the monster movies they made that immediately became iconic um my main reference point for this movie is young frankenstein i (laughs) every year around halloween since i was probably seven or eight eight or nine Mm -hmm. maybe ten uh, my dad would just put Young Frankenstein on on Halloween night and we would watch that as a family as trick-or-treaters came to the door. Mm-hmm. So, so much of what Young Frankenstein is riffing off of is this movie. Totally. And so watching this, I was like, oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it is wild to me that the monster throwing the girl into the lake is um, maybe funnier in this movie than young Frankenstein's <laughs> entire bit about it. But um, also, I don't need to make fun of the creature for that because he didn't know. Mm-hmm. And maybe Parker's about to be like, Max, that scene makes me cry. Yeah, Max, that like, really, I, like, that upsets me on a deep level. When you watch the creature throw the girl in the lake, that upsets you emotionally? You uh, get really... Not, not really, no. <laughs> Sorry. Is it, It's a little funny, though, It's right? a little funny. It's. A, I it's mean, a the little, in, internet yeah. humor has made that funny to me, in that it's I th- like I think it's his reaction when he spins, like, he's like, oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's... it's, it's uh, it's what we talked about with Fantasia, with, you know, the dinosaurs that, you know, just the, the face they make. Ah, ah, just <laughs> internet humor's kind of ruined us. Yeah, it's kind of ruined us. It's ruined <laughs> our brains. Um, but yeah, I, I watched this and I'm interested to talk about it. Yeah. Um, because I I think it's good for what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously I recognize, you know, I can watch an old movie and even if I'm not feeling it, I can be like, at the time, this was crazy. At the time, sure. this was like changing everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, I was just kind of like, all right, yeah. 70 minutes, pretty short, pretty brief, pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's in and out. It's in and out. And I just I think maybe in my head I had built it up a little bit more because mm-hmm. of kind of just what it shaped but sure i think overall from what i understand now it's more so this movie obviously gets everything started but it's the impact of the entire breadth of frankenstein movies and its interconnectedness to the other monster movies that really kind of like shaped everything this is just kind of where it started is that fair to say very much so like even to the point that like uh, a lot of my research comes from like the on disc documentary um, that has been packaged with this thing since like the mid 2000s. Um, it's like 40 mm-hmm. minutes long. And even in that, like they have probably like a minute and a half long segment of one of the film historians talking about like the significance of it at the time. And then also going into the things that don't work for him anymore about it. he's like, this probably worked at the time. I think it kind of, you know, it doesn't quite hold up in the same way, but like coming around to that same conclusion of like, yeah, it's much more about the iconography it created rather than like the plot structure of the film itself that had any sort of yeah or even for me even just like the direction or the cinematography like the movie Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about next week i feel has a much more of an atmosphere to it totally and i know that you i i saw your review and you 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 love the atmosphere of this film um so. so actually i'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit before we dive into research it's just how, how much how much do you like this film, Barker? What do you like about it? I I like uh, spoiling the ending of this for us. Uh, you gave it a three and a half. I gave it a four, and that's mm-hmm. about where I sit. Like I think it's like a, it's like a half star difference for me. You know, yeah. um, I like the uh, I like the iconography of this movie. I like the performances quite a bit. Like I think Karloff is kind of transcendent. I think it's one of the great film performances. Yeah. Um, and I am fascinated by kind of just the way it kicked everything up. I mean, like if we really are going first in the lineup, then it probably is Dracula. But like, I don't know, this, this feels like Captain America to me, you know, this feels like Iron Man. This is the beginning of the MCU. I mean, I was about to say not to... Not to talk about the MCU on this podcast, <laughs> but like Dracula's The Incredible Hulk. This is Iron Man in that they yeah. both come out in the same year, but one of them does a lot better and completely reshapes the entirety of totally. franchise filmmaking for one studio. Right. Yeah. And like this is this is Universal's output for the next 20 years is these movies. Man, it really is. This really is like, I mean, so many people compare the MCU to the Westerns, but it's like, no, this is like monster movies. This is monster movies. Like monster movies was the first connected cinematic universe of any kind. And but also even just like from, you know, doing it for 20 years Mm -hmm. and probably the reason they faded out, I imagine, is because people got sick of them and also the quality of them dropped. Right. Is that what happened? Mm -hmm. So less money went into them. The quality dropped off a lot Um, in a very interesting parallel people were coming for Lugosi and Karloff and mm. uh, Claude Rains. And 15 years in, all of these characters are being played by somebody else because they didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. 
And I think that's a big part of it, too, is they're like, I don't know, like, it's not the same when Long Chaney Jr. is being the creature, you know? Like, their yeah. people had attachment to these actors in these roles. Well, I think I just learned that that's an actor who was in monster movies and not just a name that they say in Werewolves of London, the song. Um, <laughs> now that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Quick history lesson for you, Max. Lon Chaney was the man of, a hundred, uh, man of a thousand faces. He played the original Phantom of the Opera, uh, oh. Quasimodo in the 20s. He was a, a huge star of the silent era of oh. horror. His son, Lon Chaney Jr., is the original Wolfman. <laughs> there you are. I promise I went to film school. To be fair, I mean, I, didn't I don't know that. Lon I, Chaney, I, was... I didn't take Lon Chaney Jr., <laughs> 10 10 you know, well, that's, I, 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 I don't know that a lot of these films are taught in film school so you know you're, you're not to blame you can change that parker you I can could, change the world I could, I could be the change i want to see in the world um but yeah so the like cheney it's, jr you want to see in the world exactly. is that anything no all right it isn't <laughs> move on all right let's move on but like coming back around to what I like about the film, I just like as a piece of film history, it's fascinating to me seeing the origin of like such a big film movement for a while, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, those are the things I like about it and why I was in intrigued to kind of talk about it with you. Yeah, no. Well, thank you for talking about it with me. Yes. And that's surprisingly not the end of our show. No. Parker, you've done research. I have. Into this film, which I was relieved to find out this morning because I just kind of trusted that you were the guy for this mm -hmm. as you own a, a lot of these movies. <laughs> I do. Yes. Um, Great. Okay. So yeah, I've got like, we've got broad background into hyper specific stuff that'll probably come up during the summary, but kind of broad background that I want to talk yeah. about um, is part of the reason horror movies had such a boom at the time is that this was smack dab in the middle of the great depression. And people wanted escapism. People were like, I don't want to think about the fact that I'm standing in a soup line to get my food. I want to just go pay a nickel and go see something that is going to transport me for 70 minutes. And then I can go back to the rest of my life. And so um, horror movies became a very big part of that. And psychologically, a lot of research has been done. And basically, the, the concept is that it's like, well... When life is horrible and horrifying, people try to find something that's more horrifying than what they're dealing with. And mm -hmm. they're like, well, at least it's not that. At least I'm not being chased by a vampire, you know? And that's just <laughs> kind of how, how people deal with things. Yeah, absolutely. Every time I'm going through it, I'm like, well, at least I'm not a Frankenstein monster. Yep. Hey. But, you know, to this day, though, like, I know people, <laughs> when I ask people what their comfort movie is, I get people like, Midsommar. That's my comfort movie. That's true. I'm yeah. like, okay, yeah, sure. You know, whatever works for you. Um, so that was kind of, that's that's the landscape this is existing within, right? Sure. Um, broad Strokes, uh, based on a novel by Mary Shelley, um, which was the result of a vacation in Switzerland um, that got yes. rained out her, uh, her husband, uh, Percy, and Lord Byron had a writing contest of saying, hey, who can make the best ghost story, the best spooky story? Uh, and she blew him out of the water. Um, which is interesting though, because Lord Byron, uh, his, uh, addition to this, I don't know if it was a full novella or a manuscript or whatever. Um, it became the basis for what Bram Stoker would eventually create into Dracula. So like the impetus of is that, that idea mm -hmm, wow, kind of comes from Lord Byron's first pass on things. So there was just like one night where, yeah. Like, they wrote, you know, or one night where they set into motion what would create mm -hmm. two of the strongest horror concepts in yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. Which is nuts. Wow. Kind of crazy. Um, so something that's interesting about this film, again, we're going to get into a lot of this as we go through, but um, the concept of electricity being a big part of the monster's creation, entirely fabricated in this film. Like, right. There's no right. mention in, of it. In the, the novel, original. it was more of like a, it was, yeah, there's not really a mention of how he did it, but it's assumed it was some sort of chemical thing. Mm -hmm. But in this movie they go electricity yeah like the, the the passage in the book is very intentionally vague but yeah. in this like hey electricity we're leaning on that and that has kind of stuck around as a big part of like the i mean it makes mythos. sense it makes yeah. as much sense as anything totally you know you go well the body runs on electricity so i guess that makes sense yep um so uh this film is kind of 
more so than even the book itself, it's riffing off of a stage play from 1927 written by Peggy Webling um, yes. and produced by Hamilton Dean, who also played the monster. He was a producer and an actor. Right. Um, it's, he played... it's, oh, it's not as much an adaptation of the novel as it is an adaptation of an adaptation. Totally. But even then, I think they bought the stage adaptation rights to an adaptation of that one by Peggy Webling, which mm-hmm. is in and of itself an adaptation of Mary Shelley's novel. Yeah. This is like four four things removed. Totally. Or three things removed. Um, yeah. Which I want to learn more about this play because the little bit that I found sounds buck wild, which is that oh. uh, so like – Around this time, any plays, any uh, like rewritings of the story, it was very in vogue to kind of portray Frankenstein and the monster as sort of like a Jekyll Hyde of that they are opposite sides sure. of the same coin, you know, to the point that in Dean's version, they are dressed the same. He is dressed like an English gentleman from the get go um, right. and in very similar colors. But, you know, his his hair and his makeup are very wild. Um, but the thing that was crazy to me about this, and I want to learn more about this production uh, the stage play ends with the monster ripping Frankenstein's throat out and Dean had a bucket hidden next to the table. So he like he pins the doctor down to a table and there's a bucket hiding upstage and inside the bucket are long wet pieces of sponge uh, okay. dipped in red dye that he yeah. would tear out his throat and fling it behind him on stage, <laughs> which is kind of crazy for 1927 to just have like body horror on stage. Wow, that's wild. Wow. Like, it's crazy. I'm like, I want to learn more yeah. about this. That sounds so interesting. Um, yeah. So, like you said, there was an original script pass done on this um, before any of the Wales team came on to it. Um, the At the time, the director attached to it was a man named Robert Flory, who uh, was an experimental film director. Uh, and he he was very interested in German expressionism. Like, that's where this influence comes from. Okay. German expressionism, this art movement going on in Germany at the time of exaggeration of light and shadow and the interplay between those two elements, um, kind of abstracting vision through light and shadow. At the time in the 30s, the Hollywood style of lighting was what we call flat lighting. It was make sure that everything is visible, kind of what we would consider now to be like sitcom lighting, like three sure. camera setup lighting. That yeah. was what Hollywood was doing at the time is that right. was in style. Right. Yeah. Um, so German expressionism is very, very different. And we're going to be talking about that next week with Nosferatu of, you know, a very stylized way of filming. And Flory really latches on to this. And he's like, hey, I, I love this idea. So there's an original team of Flory, uh, his screenwriter, whose last name I didn't write down, um, the producer, which is Carl Lemley Jr. Carl Lemley is the founder of Universal Studio, uh, Universal, you know, productions, pictures, yeah, uh, pictures, and his son Carl Jr. was basically like gifted the studio when he was like 24 or something like that. Mm. He's like, hey, you're in charge now, you know, like I'll oversee things generally, but like Jr. was the head by the thirties and he really liked horror movies. And so he was a big push for this. Like one of the first ones he was involved with was long Cheney's uh, hunchback of Notre Dame, which also was a huge success for the studio. Right. Um, And so, so it's Carl Lemley jr. On his producer, you've got Flory's director, his screenwriter, and they had attached and originally announced like there's, there's production material out there announcing Bella Lugosi as the monster. Because right. Dracula had come out February of this year. Frankenstein releases November of 1931. So Dracula comes out as a big success. Lugosi is launched a superstar. I mean, the assumption is just, well, he's our guy now. We're just going to do this. Right. So they produce promotional material with his face. It doesn't look very much like him in the posters they mm-hmm. release. But like it's like, Lugosi is the monster. Um, and he had issues from the start, though. He didn't want to be mute. He didn't want to be under a ton of makeup. Um, he thought he was too handsome for that. Uh, he's like, you, you can't hide this visage. Um, all right. All right. <laughs> Bella Lugosi. All right, Bella. <laughs> um, apparently there, there was test footage shot of him as the monster, um, which has been lost to time. Nobody, nobody mm-hmm. can find it. But according to accounts of people who saw it, uh, his makeup was very similar to that of a film called the golem, which came out a few years yes. previous, which yeah, also is kind of that. a direct influence on this film, which the golem, um, is a, folktale from uh jewish mythology of a creature crafted from clay uh that then comes to life uh is corrupted wreaks havoc kind of a thing right um and the golem's makeup has this kind of like 
bowl cut with fringe on the side and kind of a wide set face. And by by accounts, uh, Lugosi's makeup test was very similar to that, that kind yeah. of look. Um, and he just didn't like it. They didn't like it. Somewhere in all of this, there's no record in any of the paperwork why the change happened. But at some point, Flory was either removed from the project or stepped back from it and Wales was slotted in. Yeah. Um, and Flory disappeared. Uh, he eventually, like, um, in the, uh, all of the German posters for the actual released film have a credit for him somewhere of, you know, mm. some, some, something talking about his, you know, contributions to the film, but otherwise, um, he kind of disappeared from the project and Wales comes in. Um, now Whale, he had come up from the theater in England, uh, where he worked, he met and worked with Colin Clive, who plays Dr. Frankenstein in this. That's where they met. Right. Um, before this, he was noted for his direction of World War I dramas. That was kind of where he was cutting his teeth with Universal. Uh, and interestingly enough, at this time, there's a huge influx of theater directors in Hollywood, specifically because of the um, invention of sound. They're like, oh, mm. our actors have to talk. We should probably get directors who know how to direct actors to talk <laughs> instead of just emote, right? Right. And so you have this big influx of theater directors where uh, he comes from. So that's kind of setting the table there. Um, there is more so in Bride than this, but like it, it's here as well. Um, a big part of Whale's contribution to horror cinema is that um, it was kind of an open secret at the time that he was gay. Um, obviously mm -hmm. couldn't be talked about it super directly, but people knew. It was just yeah. people wouldn't talk about it. Interesting. That's Which I, James. Yeah. You said that was the director, James yeah, Whale? Yeah, James Whale. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so there is a lot of kind of his experience as an outsider being grafted onto the creature in both of these films. Okay. Yeah. And, and you said that feels like it's more in bride. Yeah. Right? More in yeah. bride. Than I feel like this. we get more time with the creature in bride. Totally. But because like watching this, I'm like, when he goes out for like 10 minutes, <laughs> like, yeah. no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but oh, that's, that's kind really of, it's, it's, it's a flavor he brings to it, which, yeah. you know, as, as scholar research has gone on, like it's become a big part of the discussion of both his career and these films is the fact yeah. that he was, you know, a gay man living in Hollywood where he couldn't really talk about it. I mean, that feels like it's such a common story in folks who are involved in horror cinema mm -hmm. in particular. It feels like oftentimes people who wind wind up being connected to those um often have that kind of experience i feel i don't know if Very that's much true so. but it no, feels I, like yeah. i i hear yeah. that often enough i i would agree um so uh that kind of gets our stage set for whale um boris karloff uh he was born william henry pratt he's he English. was it's true mm -hmm. yes indeed um <laughs> interestingly enough uh part of the reason both the name change that he gave himself. He, he chose his stage name in 1911, saying that Boris sounded exotic and Karloff was a family name somewhere down his lineage. Uh, his daughter um, kind of contests that claim. She's like, I haven't found Karloff anywhere in the family trees, but I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe there's something I don't know. Um, but also part of the reason that he uh, was, you know, he, he would play characters, you know, later he plays uh, the mummy um, and things like that uh -huh. uh, and other kind of uh ethnic characters within horror um part of that it doesn't fully excuse it obviously but um uh he was one quarter indian which i guess would it make him one half indian if on both sides like both his parents come from uh like mixed marriages i don't know how all that works but he had he had a very like he had a very dark complexion for an englishman which is mm. kind of part of it he had kind of like a bronzy skin Interesting. um so the way that it's so interesting to me learning about the studio system and just how these movies worked. So the whole impetus of him getting cast in this movie is literally just that he was in the commissary <laughs> yeah. at Universal just eating lunch and James Whale spots him and calls him over and he's like, your face is very, very interesting. Like he just was yeah. just taken by his facial features. <laughs> they talked about, you know, they, they bonded over both, uh, you know, their experience growing up and working in England in the theater and things like that. And he's like, I, I would really love you to come uh, screen test for this part. And just like he did an audition, he was just yeah. getting lunch. Yeah. He was just like, that's crazy. Everyone out there who's on the grind, try getting lunch. Yeah, just try getting lunch. Just try getting lunch. I recommend getting lunch at um oh, what's that that chain restaurant? I think it was opened by 
uh, Carl Lumley's son, um, mm. Hardy's. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yes, Hardy's. Of course. <laughs> it's good. Thank um, you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Um, they shot in August. Production was uh, about six weeks, from what I understand. Uh, it's yeah. crazy to me, like, the turnaround on these things. Yeah, I mean, I was just about to say. <laughs> yeah, they wrapped. So they they wrapped, uh, like, very beginning of October. This comes out in November. So yeah. post-production was a month on this thing. Easy. Crazy. Easy. Easy. Just so easy. easy to make. It, movies are easy. Movies That's are what I'm easy. learning. That's what why, I'm learning. Why take any amount of time at all? Yeah, why would you do that? Um, Every movie should be 70 minutes, and you're only allowed to film for six weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, let's see here. So, um, the iconic I makeup. I want to clarify that's a joke. Okay, that's keep a joke. Going. That's Sorry. a joke. Ha the ha, makeup, funny. The iconic makeup. <laughs> the iconic makeup is designed by Jack Pierce. He was the head of the makeup department at Universal. He did all of these guys. He did the money. He did Wolfman. He did Frankenstein. Like, huge he pioneer. Did, of the he did the money. He did, he did the money. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Parker, what am I supposed to do when you're, when you're when you're giving really val- valuable and interesting information, and uh-huh. I just have to sit here? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> he makes the jokes. He I does make the Carl's funnies. Junior jokes. I say the money when you get the word the wrong. <laughs> yes, he did the mummy, um, but yeah, he did like all of these very yeah. iconic monster makeups. Um, of course, yeah, That's he's really he's cool. incredible. Uh, so, like a breakdown of his process, which is just very interesting to me. The brow piece is made up of cotton, spirit gum, and collodion, and they build it up layer by layer, and it would harden. Um, A really rather painful process, because uh, collodion and spirit gum both, like, let off, like, acidic fumes, and having that that close to your eyes is really uncomfortable. So just not a great experience for Boris. Boris Karloff. Oh, Um, man. But he, you know, he was a trooper about it. Uh... They um, did the original screen test and Karloff came back and he said, I, I look too alive in the eyes. I want, mm. I want to look more dead. And so they put mortician's wax on his upper eyelids to make them very bulky and heavy. Interesting. Um, which kind of helped him with that. Additionally, Karloff, um, he had a bridge in his mouth on his right side. And so yes. he'd take that out and his entire like right cheek would collapse in. Yeah. So that kind of sucked cheek on the right side is just, that's just the way Karloff's face worked. They didn't even know that when he was eating lunch. No, no clue. Um, The whole process took about three and a half hours to apply and the same amount of time to remove. Um, So seven hours in that chair every single day. Yeah. Is, you know, uh, Karloff would say that like, he was obviously very grateful to this role and loved playing it, but also that it was incredibly physically taxing because sure. you're in a makeup chair for seven hours every day. You're wearing an all black costume. They're shooting yeah. in August in California. And each boot was like 13 pounds. Yep. Is that they the line, case? Yep, they they yeah. lined it with lead, um, which is a trick uh, they learned from, um, uh, oh geez. It's one of the, it's one of the silent films that you really like that you want me to watch. And I haven't seen it. What is it called? sunrise yes yes they got it from sunrise there's there's a character in that there's like one shot of like a guy going to a boat and he's very sad and they lined his shoes with lead yeah to like have like really clotting so they they stole that trick from sunrise yeah that's another murnau film Mm -hmm. um you know yeah it's very interesting yeah i'm excited to check that out at some point um so yeah they um did the shoes i'm glad you mentioned that i had that written down as well uh so things (laughs) Um, the, uh, designer Herman Rossi and art director Charles Hall gave the whole thing a very gothic look. Originally Rossi wanted like all of the, uh, like he, he, all of his concept art was much more futuristic, especially within the, uh, the laboratory had much more of a Mm. metropolis feel to it, but they wanted to, uh, they wanted to swing it more gothic. So they kind of, you know, made it more of the spooky castle, um, whale himself had experience as a production designer and did a lot of his own sketches um there was a years long uh kind of friendly debate between whale and pierce on who created the makeup like whale was like it was based uh, on my sketches like i kind of came up with the basic idea and <laughs> pierce is like no i designed it actually and they would kind of have a tit for tat it seemed it seemed like they were very amicable with each other but mm-hmm. that was a thing that existed for a very long time for decades and decades later of who kind of created the 
the basic framework. One thing that Whale was very adamant about is that he came up with the flat top of the head mm. because he's like, well, you could swap the brain in and out very easily that way. You could you could open sure. it up like a a uh, <laughs> what did he, a tin of roast beef. <laughs> Which is a very English yeah. thing to say. <laughs> um, for Whale, verticality is a huge thing in his kind of shot composition structuring, especially in mm. this film. Like, there's yeah. a lot of, like, vertical space within the frame. All kind of leading in towards that moment where, like, they open the kind of the sunroof and, like, he, re- he reaches up for the light. Yeah. It kind of feels like that entire choice of verticality is just to justify that one scene in a way because yeah. it really lands. Um, totally all of the electrical equipment in the laboratory was created by kenneth uh strickfaden who is a santa monica inventor uh his machines are still owned by universal today and have been used for decades Um, yes they make an appearance in the cinematic classic van helsing oh yes they do (laughs) yes they they? do they are there wow um we're just sitting in his garage for a while though we're just like yeah i don't know (laughs) the uh they would rent it out from him for like oh, okay. 30 yeah. years. And then I think they finally bought it sometime in the seventies. We're like, we should yeah. probably own this stuff, huh? <laughs> um, I thought this was really interesting. And I've been like, I, I had to look this up cause I was, I watched this with Rio and both of us were like, I don't understand the name change. I don't know why mm. it's Henry Frankenstein. And not so Frankenstein. yeah, I looked into this. Yes. And let me know if your research lines Please. up with this. This is what I found mm-hmm. was that the studio felt that Victor, the name from the novel was too sharp mm-hmm. and that American audiences wouldn't like it as much. They yep. wouldn't find it like a, a heroic name totally, or, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. And so they changed his name to Henry and gave the name Victor to the other guy. To the Moritz. other guy. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you found? <laughs> yeah, too? very much so. Yeah. Just okay, yeah. because that's wild. Just the me. studio being like the, the, the words I found was, quote, severe and unfriendly. Severe and unfriendly. <laughs> was that's the name Victor. And yeah. I was like, that's so funny. We'll still keep the name in the movie, though. Mm-hmm. As a guy who's not inherently villainous, just there's another guy who can be named Victor. Yep, 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 yep. Um, um, let's see. Yeah. Also interesting to me, Parker, uh-huh. was that the opening credits say, based on the novel by Mrs. Percy B. Shelley. Mm-hmm. Did you catch that? Yeah, I did. I find that annoying. I, also I understand find that, that annoying. it's 1931 and that they're like, well, women. But it's Man, like... Man, Man, Man. At this point, like mid 18, if I remember correctly, like mid 1800s, it was like, okay, we'll recognize, you know, because it was initially she released a novel with no name attached. Yep. And then like 20, 30 years after that, it's like, okay, Mary Shelley wrote it. And then even then a lot of scholars were like, well, but Percy Shelley probably wrote most of this, right? Yeah. Um, And then, so like, I, I, I understand that it's 1931 and they're like, well, Mrs. Percy B. Shelley. And I'm right. just like, all right. Her name anyway, is I, Mary. I just found that really annoying. I agree. I'm not. A, I'm not a fan of that. I'm glad you. I'm glad you called that well, out. I'm glad you didn't go. I'm actually a fan of that, Max. I'm actually, a big fan of the patriarchy. That would have been really. <laughs> just call me Parker Patriarchy. Hey, can we? Can we clip that? <laughs> can someone out there clip that and use that to mm-hmm. um, blackmail Parker, please? Yeah, please. Thank you. Please and thank you. Thank um, you. Okay, the rest of this will probably show up in the specific scenes that we're talking about. Right. Um, but the last little bit of research before we get into the summary, um, just because these numbers are wild to me. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was a massive success. Uh, budget of, at the time, $262,000 adjusted for inflation today's money. That's around $5.5 million. Okay. In the first six months, it grossed $1.4 million in 1931, which is, 200, uh, which is $29 million today. So on a budget of 5.5, okay. 5, it made 29 million in six months. Um, and by 1953, with re-releases, right, it had grossed. And like this is hard to gauge because of like inflation over those years. An estimate of adjusting for inflation in the course of 20 years, it made around 200 to 250 million dollars. Yeah, in that's 20 awesome. years. Yeah, off of a that's... budget of 5.5. <laughs> For today's money, which is just nuts. Yeah, that's wild. It's crazy. Um, um, I mean, it's a classic. It is very much so. Uh, classic. The film was added to the National Film Registry in 1991. Yes. Um, it is listed 87th on AFI's 100 Years 100 Movies list, and I thought mm-hmm. this was interesting. Uh, it's Alive, It's Alive is 49th on their 100 Movies quotes. Rosebud is 17th. Aha. Uh-huh. Which. 
<laughs> feels should Rose, wrong should to Rosebud me. Should Rosebud count as a quote? <laughs> no, like that, like that's, I don't know. Look, I need to, I need to like go look at the rest of the look, list and maybe we'll do this off mic at some point, but like <laughs> it's alive. It's alive should be like top 10. People that appears, use that constantly. They use it as a sample in songs. People say it all the time. I yeah. feel like even today you could ask most people mm-hmm. and if you were like, okay, Frankenstein's creatures come to life. What does he say? I feel like yeah. they'd be like, it's a lie. I've, I've been, a, I've been a, I've been in a room with my grandfather fiddling with a TV. And when the TV turns on, he goes, it's right. alive. He doesn't say Rosebud. <laughs> no, no. Larry doesn't say Rosebud. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Larry doesn't say Rosebud. <laughs> this is the worst day of my life. Pour one out. Um, yeah. So that's kind of, general research there's other things with scene specific stuff i'll chime in with but that kind of sets our sure. stage um okay yeah so the credits happen and then we get a little man comes out well the little man comes first it's the very oh, first oh thing. he comes first very okay very mm-hmm. first thing i'm sorry that's okay. classic max i have to get the first two scenes mixed <laughs> up right yeah uh the little man comes out and he says hello everyone mm-hmm. this movie's scary this is a big okay? scary movie everyone be chill mm-hmm. it's scary be ready. Yep. And then he goes away. Uh, and they made that because a lot of scenes in this were mostly very controversial for people. Totally. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because so, there was like a good chunk of this that had to get cut out in Kansas. Mm-hmm. Like people were like, that line about he knows what it's like to be God. That's, you know, that's blasphemous. And Yeah. Uh, that disappeared for like around. 30 years. It was cut for yeah. TV in the 50s and it didn't make it back until like the early 80s. Yeah. Wow. And nuts. even then, like I think I was reading it. It's like still not super clear what he says because yeah. like efforts to re kind of re like put it back in have been like marred by the fact that yeah, it was gone they, they, they cut it out and then they put like a thunderclap over the top of it and they yeah. weren't able to remove the thunderclap so they just tried to mix it real in a quick different way. it is called castle thunder and it's one of the most used sound effects of all time Parker. there you go castle thunder <laughs> castle thunder and this is the movie that it was made for cool it appears here first i love and that. it appears in like every hanna barbera cartoon yeah anytime basically until like the mid 80s when you saw a spooky castle in a tv show mm-hmm. it was probably castle thunder i that love played. that so much isn't that great that's so this, really cool i was gonna bring that up in criteria because i'm yeah. like that's a big that's thing. big that's big <laughs> that's really yeah. interesting i love castle that thunder um but yeah so this whole this whole intro is there specifically because In 1931, there is a lot of shocking stuff in this, like very macabre imagery and sound design. Like specifically, they called out like the putting a microphone inside the coffin when the dirt is being shoveled on was very upsetting for people. Sure. You know, so it's things like that. It still is. I cried. (laughs) I I cried and I I cried and I pissed my pants. Yeah, of course. Thanks for asking. Thanks for outing me in front of everyone. Hey, well, that's what I'm here for. Um, So continue onward. (laughs) Yes. Uh, we so start with our intro with from intros, Edward Benson. This movie's scary. Yeah, spooky. Credits. Mrs. Percy B. Shelley. Also fun. The monster. Question mark. Who could have played the monster? Ooh. It's like when they uh it's like when they credited the skeleton as himself in yep. House on Haunted Hill. It's great. I love and it this- when credits are just like this is a big Spooky. thing at the time. Like when Lon Chaney did Phantom of the Opera, like all production stills, they painted over his face. They censored it before the movie. Wow. Like, we don't want you to see it. Like you don't see the makeup until you're in the theater. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't, Wouldn't that, be that be nice, nice to have a surprise? If, if, if every, every trailer that came out now was like, we're going to hide stuff. I'm not saying not all of them do anyway. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't need to defend trailers. <laughs> Something that people are mostly <laughs> negative about. Sure. Okay. So we open and it's Dr. Henry Frankenstein Mm -hmm. digging in a cemetery with his assistant. Fritz. Fritz? Yep. Huh? Igor doesn't come come until the third and fourth movie in this franchise. Played by Bella Lugosi. Yeah. And then if I understand right, it's like that. And then also like it's kind of there's like maybe one other thing, but it's like mostly young Frankenstein also kind of cements kind of solidifies that character it is this and then from there it's like okay like igor Anybody is yeah is a character who got his own animated film remember yeah. that yeah i do yeah i do hey remember remember when uh daniel radcliffe played a hot version oh yeah he played hot igor in that hot movie igor. hot igor yeah hot igor starring james mcavoy hot igor starring james mcavoy as not hot igor <laughs> yep 
What a time. What a, but yeah, what so all like that that stock character initiate like it it it, it starts here though. Even it though he isn't named here. Igor, it starts Because there here. isn't an assistant in the novel. No. Why did they make a spooky little guy to hang out with him then? I don't know. On it like it's not I think, like it's not like they talk so much that you're like, "Oh, we needed the cuz sometimes they'll invent a character when adapting sure. the book so that the the main character has someone to talk to and express the thoughts to." Yeah. But it's like I don't feel like I, Henry honestly, Frankenstein is talking it, too like much. It could have it might have just been a studio note. It might have been that like a studio head saw Dwight Fry in Dracula as Renfield. And he's like, ooh, spooky little guy. Oh, is he, he putting Renfield him in Dracula? He's Renfield in Dracula. So they were just like, give him a Renfield. Yeah, give him a Renfield. Let's let's stick another uh, spooky man servant in here. Should always be a spooky little sidekick guy. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, good for Dwight Fry. I'm glad he got more work off the back of, <laughs> off the hunchback of, <laughs> well, I guess that doesn't make sense. He got it off the back of Renfield. All right. Remember when Renfield got his own movie? Yeah. Crazy. Again, we like that's. Just, we should just keep giving these spooky little guys movies. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Does the creature from the Black Lagoon have anybody? Is there like a little spooky tadpole man or something? No, it's just he's we a should, solo act. James Wan. Hey. You there's a there's an opportunity here. <laughs> there's a, an unfulfilled niche here. <laughs> he needs a spooky little assistant, spooky and then guess guy. what? You can tell the studio. Immediate spinoff starring that guy. Mm-hmm. IP potential. <laughs> there's IP potential in. Creature from the Black Lagoon's little tadpole this. man. All right. He uh, could be hot, too. I hate the society right. we live in. Okay. Well, buckle up, because now we're going to watch a movie about how twisted society is. Ooh. They burn down a windmill. Ugh. Spoilers. Okay, so Fritz, they dig up the coffin. They mm-hmm. steal the body. They realize the head and the brains of the body are severely damaged. They decide to steal a brain. Wild to me, again, as someone who'd only seen Young Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I just assumed so much of that was invented for that. No, it's literally this scene. Yeah. Like, like Igor getting the brain in Mm -hmm. Young Frankenstein is basically the exact same scene except that he just looks to the camera and points at the, like, Mm -hmm. I did not realize it was so similar. Yeah, Um, it's, it's pretty spot on. Which did make it hard for me to take it seriously, unfortunately. That's just what happens when you see the the parody first. Look, Rio and I were having a good chuckle about just normal and abnormal brain is very funny. And there's like, I I should have written it down, like in Latin above it is really funny too. It's like cerebrum abnormo or something (laughs) like that. (laughs) It's really silly. Wow. That's wild. So, uh, yeah, Fritz picks up the normal brain and then he bumps, turns it back around, bumps into a real human skeleton. Well, there's the <laughs> he's he's startled by an off screen gong. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. What huh? it, I don't know what it is. It's not a bell chime. It's a gong. Yeah. And he gets spooked hey, and he drops you don't it. Know, you don't know like the science lab gong that goes off in the middle of the night? Right. Yeah, of course. Everyone knows about those. But he also the skeleton that's hanging there was a real guy. It was a real skeleton because yeah. uh, they it was cheaper and easier to get than building one for yourself. So mm-hmm. um, love that. Skeleton as himself, you yeah. could say. Skeleton as himself. Uh, and then he drops the normal brain, grabs the abnormal brain, and he heads out. Yep. Um, Meanwhile, Henry's fiance Elizabeth, speaks with their friend Victor. Wow, I, I don't know. I don't know if I like that guy. His name just sounds too severe. Severe. Oh, too S- severe. Something very like interesting it. about this scene as like a choice that Whale makes is that it starts with a very odd series of shots. Like most of the time, style of the time would dictate you open a dialogue scene with an establishing shot of where they are. And this is four close-ups. It's <laughs> Henry's picture on the piano, the yes. maid coming in, a jump cut in the middle of that same shot of Victor walking in and Elizabeth standing. And then mm-hmm. we get the wide shot. And they talk about this documentary. It's like, it's a very strange series of shots, but whale does this a lot in his filmography of kind of just waking the audience up being like, Hey, you got to engage. You got to figure out where you are and what's going on. And then I will mm. give you the information in a couple seconds, but like try and figure this out yourselves. That's really interesting. Yeah. Just, wow. Very interesting choice. Yeah. So this is a scene in which uh, they just talk about how con- how concerned they are about Henry. Mm-hmm. Um, Elizabeth and Victor ask uh, Waldman for help understanding Henry's behavior. Waldman was introduced in the previous scene. He was doing a little lesson on yeah body. He's doing anatomy stuff, you mm-hmm. know. He's saying, and this is where the body is. And everyone and went, here we oh. Have the body. And then they went, oh. Oh, that's what it is. And then he said, class dismissed. Dismissed. <laughs> That's the whole class. He's yeah. like, and this is what a body looks like. 
Now, in summary. <laughs> in summary, this is what a body looks like. And everyone went, oh, okay. Oh, so sure. now that we've caught everyone up, now we can continue with the recap. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Waldman reveals he is aware Henry wishes to create life. Concerned, they go to the lab. And when they get to the lab, they're kind of like, we don't see them initially. Initially, we just go to the lab mm-hmm. and Frankenstein and Fritz love that. They should open a little law Frank firm. and Fritz. Maybe try Frank. Whoa. Frank and Fritz. And uh, wow. <laughs> wow. Sorry. I liked it even more the second time. <laughs> um, they are, they're preparing. They've got the body under a tarp and they're like, we got the lightning up there. We're going to do it. And the set yeah. looks great. Yeah. Good set. Everyone comes in and they go, what are you doing? He goes, don't, don't touch that. Don't interrupt me. You're, mm-hmm. you're going to love this. Is Colin Clive doing an accent here? I can't remember. Is he doing like a Swiss accent or is he just kind of because there's a little bit of something in there, I thought. There's a little bit of something. Because the way he says it's alive. Like, yeah, that's not I think just I think he's British. he's adding he's adding a touch for sure. But a lot of a lot of this is just how he speaks. Okay. But he is he's spinning a couple of those inflections for sure. Every once um, in a while. Something very interesting about this scene is that like another influence of Wales theater background is this whole kind of like show he puts on for all of them he's like you sit here you sit here i'm gonna tell you about what i'm doing right and like right. that that distinct choice i think is a very uh very theatrical staging of this moment of like literally giving him a captive audience that he can monologue to yeah uh, which is just a lot of fun and like colin does a great job it's it is a bummer he, he died young he was like 37 he yeah it's really sad it's really really sad because yeah, he think, did he did bride and then yeah like died basically the next yeah and i I, yeah i think he's really great like i would have loved to see more from him in his career yeah Yeah. it's a shame yeah um they throw the body up no they don't throw it up there's just lightning comes down no they they raise it they raise it up okay yeah i remember okay Mm -hmm. i was right they raise up the body and uh it comes back down and it starts moving and then it's alive this is this is like we talk about the silliness of the movie right yeah and it is silly in a lot of ways by modern standards I think that close-up shot of the hand moving it's is great. genuinely effective. And like to the this effect, day. like the makeup effect of like the stitching on it mm-hmm. looks great and how it moves is really effective. And yeah. then I think even just like there's a reason that it's alive is 49th on the list of great quotes. Because totally. it's really it's a great moment. And the way he plays it is fantastic. And it yeah. just it's really solid. It's just really great. I agree. Um, like I think I think this might be the best scene in the movie. Which I think it is. It feels kind of hard to argue. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, it is. I th- and I think it's genuinely effective in a lot of I ways. I mean, the climax is kind of visually very oh, And that was like, the, that's the only other thing that kind of yeah. you know, jostles But I think me. this is more memorable and interesting. Totally. Um, yeah, so uh, Frankenstein's monster is here, everybody. Mm-hmm. Seems to be innocent. It's a little childlike. Kind of reaches towards the sunlight, which is great. It's a mm-hmm. great moment that I hadn't really seen. I don't think I'd had that really spoiled for me necessarily. So I was, yeah. I was glad to see that. Um, Fritz enters with a flaming torch, frightens the monster. Um, they mistake it for it attacking them. It's mm-hmm. chained in the dungeon. Something um, interesting about this introduction that I like a lot that just, again, is a very interesting choice is at the very, very moment that he's first introduced, he walks in through the door backwards, which yes. is only done for the audience, right? It is only done for the reveal. It doesn't make any logical sense. But then like he turns and it does those jump cuts inward of bam, yeah. bam, bam in on his face. Yeah. And just, again, like very interesting directing choice from Whale yeah. for a 30s it, film. It almost feels like I also just in the last week I watched John Ford's Stagecoach mm. um, and it's it almost feels like early version of like the John Wayne hero shot from that movie. Totally. Right. Of like him turning and then like instead of doing like, you know, pushing in and refocusing, it's like. Yeah. Just we're going to jump cut it. Like, totally. I don't know. It's just it, it's a it's, very interesting, like, twist on a hero shot. Basically. Very much so. And it's it like feels, we're introducing it feels like he's introducing like, obviously, you want to make sure that the monster has like an impact. But it sure. also just kind of feels like he's like, I'm introducing the most iconic version of this character for the mm-hmm. rest of the time. And I have to make it interesting. Yeah. He doesn't choose to make it entirely glorifying or sweeping. It's like, no, we're just going to make it weird and memorable. Yeah, it's jarring. Just, it's jarring. It's That's a jarring a introduction. It's just a and jarring I, introduction. I like that a lot. And Comes like, in backwards, turns, jump cuts. Yeah. It's like, and oh. it feels like stylistically this has been replaced by either a push-in or a zoom. We don't see right. a lot of this kind of cutting anymore. No. And it's, yeah. I don't know. It's a very interesting choice. I, I'd be interested to see its effectiveness. Yeah, totally. Uh, but, oh, right, continue. 
Yeah, so um, Fritz is antagonizing with a torch. Uh, we hear Fritz scream and they run down. And, uh, the monster got is, is got him. He got him. Hung him with his whip. Yeah, which is great image. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Monster lunges. This is a pretty quick recap, I feel. Yeah, <laughs> it is a short you know. movie. Yeah, monster must be destroyed. Henry prepares an injection of a powerful drug, uh, or rather um, a sedative. Mm-hmm. And the two conspire to release the monster and inject it as it attacks. So they, they get it in the back, yeah. Yeah. falls unconscious. Boris Karloff's doing great. Yeah. Let's just say that. Mm-hmm. Um, I like how he like moves around when he's like, anyway, it's just yeah, great. When he's drugged. Yeah. yeah, when he's drugged, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, Good physicality. Henry collapses from the exhaustion. Elizabeth and Henry's father take him home. Baron Frankenstein is so funny to I me love because the Baron. <laughs> any amount that like Colin Clive, that's his name, right? Yeah, I is that think his so. name? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any amount of like little yeah, twist he's putting on lines every once in a while and just like the energy he's putting into it. And then the Baron, in my reading of him, he just feels like man. He just, just feels yeah. like British man. Like is mm-hmm. he he's British. Like he's English. Yeah, he's right? fully yeah, just he's British. Of, he's not he's not English. even attempting to He's German. just going he's just going, What? My son? And you're just like, wow, this guy There's another woman. That's what I know. <laughs> yeah. It's really good. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Um <laughs> it's just yeah, Baron Frankenstein. Shout out to that guy. Good bit um, of levity. Henry, Henry, yeah. Um, Henry's worried about the monster. Waldman reassures him he'll destroy it. Henry's mm-hmm. at home. He prepares for the wedding. Waldman examines the monster. As he prepares to vivisect it, the monster strangles him. I love yes. his little note that he's like, hey, uh, you know, sedation isn't working. He needs larger and larger doses. I'm just going to do it. And also I'm like, <laughs> he's like, it'll be done painlessly. It'll be fine. I'm like, you're dissecting him. Like, you're not just, like, <laughs> lethal injecting this guy. Like, you have a scalpel. What are you going to do? It's not going to hurt at all. It's not going to hurt at all. You don't know this guy. Yep. I think it'll probably hurt him. He's alive. He's alive. It's alive. It's alive. <laughs> what, what if he said it like, it's alive. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld as Dr. Yeah. Frankenstein. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's alive. <laughs> so dumb this is, this is why people come to this show i think so when the monster escapes he meets a little girl playing near the water they throw flowers in the water yep. enjoying the plane the clumsy monster proceeds to pick up the girl and throw her in the water too uh, it gets carried away so i thought i thought this was uh very funny um so marilyn harris is the name of the actress she was seven yep. when this was done okay and they're all at the studio they're loading into trucks to go to film out on the lake and she spots Karloff in makeup for the first time and she runs up to him and says, may I ride with you? And Karloff responded, <laughs> oh, would you, darling? <laughs> and so they just, she loved him. Like, he was just a pussycat. Aww. Like, just, she, she really took a shine to him. Um, when they filmed this scene, uh, they, uh, you know, she, she tosses her in. And the first time they did it, she didn't sink. Like, she just kind of floated on top. And James Whale came to her and he's like, uh, he's like, Marilyn, he's like, what what can I give you to make you do this again? Because I know you're all wet and we have to dry you off and that's not fun for you. Like, how how can I convince you to do one more take? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just a very 30s answer. She's like, I want a dozen hard-boiled eggs because my mother has me on a diet and she won't let me eat them. <laughs> and Wales is like, you got it. And so she does it again. The next week in her dressing room was two dozen hard-boiled eggs for her. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. great. <laughs> that <was> silly. <laughs> I thought you were. I, you, I thought you were going to be like candy or something. No. <laughs> Hard, Hard boiled, boiled eggs. eggs. It's the thirties, man. That's what, the, that's what the kids want in the thirties. The kids, the hey, children the yearn for the hard. eggs. Children yearn for the eggs. <laughs> 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 he throws her in the water. Yeah, that's and it, and it made me laugh. I'm sorry, Parker. I know it's really upsetting yep. for you. Well, it was upsetting to um, everyone yeah, in the world, and so. they cut it out. They and in they the cut places. it out and like the way they cut it, they showed it in the documentary. Might arguably like I I like Karloff's reaction at the end, and I, I would want to keep that. But like the cut that they had is kind of more ominous, which is that he throws the flower and looks at his hands, looks up at her and smiles and reaches for, her, and then it immediately cuts to just the partying in the village. That's scarier. It's scarier, I think. That's scarier. I think that's I think that's genuinely scarier because then the next time we see Maria, she's just dead in her father's arms. That's worse. Yeah, they didn't see that that was worse. That's oh. I'm like, yeah, they're like, oh, this is the this is tamer version. I'm like, at least this we know it was an accident. Like this feels so that much implies, more malicious. And also, like, 
I mean, maybe later they say drowned, but there would just be this question of like, what did he do? Yeah. I don't know about that, guys. I don't know, I guys. Just kept her going in the water. It looked like she had fun. Yeah, sploosh. Just got thrown in the water. Sploosh, uh-huh. even. Uh-huh. <laughs> if you will. If you will. With preparations for the wedding completed, Henry, he's with Elizabeth. They're going to marry soon. Waldman mm-hmm. arrives. Victor rushes in. He says that Waldman has been... Oh, sorry. Not as soon as Waldman arrives. Victor arrives. Yes. He rushes in saying that Waldman has been found strangled. Henry suspects the monster. Huh? Um, locks her mo- in her room. <laughs> he he locks his fiance in her room and says, stay there. Mm-hmm. You'll, and then they go running around the house. Yep. Uh, and then the monster enters Elizabeth's room and yep. she screams. Uh, um, so when they were doing this scene, May Clark, who plays Elizabeth, she loved working with Karloff. Like they would just chat yeah. and chat and chat. They was just like, he was so sociable and so much fun to talk to and work with. Um, and she said during this scene, she was worried that in the makeup, he would actually like really frighten her and she'd freeze up and she'd ruin the scene. She's like, if I turn around and I see you like right there, like, I don't know, like it's just, it's very frightening makeup. I'm worried about it. And uh, Karloff being the soft gentleman that he is, he's like, he's like, okay, okay, here's what we're going to do. He's like, if you get, you know, to, to help you not get overwhelmed, he's like, if you feel yourself freeze up, look at my upstage hand away from camera and I'm just going to be wiggling my pinky the entire time and I'm going to look silly and ridiculous and you'll just, it'll remind you that it's just, it's just Boris under here. Yeah. And he did that. Like wow. that's just neat. And that helped her get through the scene of just, if it, if she froze up, she's just like, Oh look, it's just Boris doing his little pinky finger that's at me. Great. Boris Karloff seems like he was pretty great. He seems like a pretty cool guy. Yeah. Um, this week comes out Boris <laughs> dun, Karloff. Dun. <laughs> supported some awful cause <laughs> oh no please oh, he, he supported the awful cause not the awful cause hate that one hate it yeah, when people support the that worst one. anyway so uh searchers arrive they find elizabeth in shock then unconscious the monster has escaped he does Ooh. that a lot he does maria's father arrives carrying his drowned daughter's body i think that's the most effective horror image in the movie to me is just his face as he carries her through i really love that long take of him yeah. walking through the village and like the music dying down and yeah. singing and like everybody just it's it's really effective it's really i think it's i think yeah i think that's also a good contender for like most effective scene totally in the movie i think that you know the monster coming to life and the climax are obviously more exciting and more iconic in that way. But I think this is like the scariest. I think, I think you're right. I think this might be the most horrifying image. Yeah. It's horrifying. Yeah. I think so. I agree. Um, yeah. So he says she was murdered. The villagers form a mob to capture the monster during the search. Henry is attacked by the monster Mm -hmm. monster knocks him unconscious and carries him to an old windmill. Um, this was big for me, Parker, because I had seen Van Helsing. Yeah. Four or five times now because of you. <laughs> Parker makes me watch it every Halloween. He makes me. And I'm he making you do it again down. this year. It's like a clockwork orange. He makes me watch Van Helsing. It's true. 15 um, days. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I didn't realize that that movie basically opens where this movie ends. And I thought mm-hmm. that was very, that's, you know what? Great job, Van Helsing. That's pretty yeah. interesting. Nice job, Steven. Um, yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> Nice job. <laughs> we'll talk about that one day we'll the peasants hear the creature carrying henry find it climbing to the top dragging henry with it the monster hurls the scientist to the ground his fall is broken by the wooden plates of the windmill saving his life which i was like that's <laughs> wild with yeah. that i don't the, know the rag doll of it all <laughs> yeah some of the um, villagers bring him oh sorry no just in in the windmill is another one of my favorite shots which is oh, just yes. both of them looking at each other through like the spinning centrifuge and like the beams yeah. going in front i like those two shots a lot yeah great shots um some of the villagers bring him home while the rest of the mob set the windmill ablaze with the monster trapped inside with nowhere to escape and as we know he died yep and they never yep. made another one of these never made another one again and it's it, it like out of all the the classic movie monsters like it's kind of baked into the text that the creature is the most sympathetic and the most kind of tragic but like especially in this scene just like his cries of pain and him fear, crying out is really it's effective yeah, you know it's, it's just like oh i i don't feel good about this no at the end the movie's like it's just a question right before the credits. Did you feel good about this? Mm-hmm. You yes. did this. It you did this. You did this. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the end at Castle Frankenstein, Henry's father celebrates the wedding of his recovered son with a toast to a future grandchild. Crazy. 
I just, yeah, I feel like that's, um, original ending. Frankenstein dies. He, he yeah. dies from the fall and the studio yeah. said no needs to be a happy ending. So they tacked on that. That's... Oh, he's, he's in bed and he's okay. Yeah. Because they, we don't even see him. Do we like, you see him through the doorway asleep in the bed. Right. But it's like, it's not like he's okay. No, he's just in bed. <laughs> and his yeah, dad's just, just like, I'm super stoked about this guy. Hey, it's all good. He's going to make Gotta... a full recovery. It's going to be fine. It's like the opposite of the ending of psycho, but just as like, egregious to me it's just like and he's fine and they're we're gonna have a grandchild and i'm so happy i'm his father i'm your favorite character in the movie yep um and that's frankenstein 70 minutes 70 minutes it's brisk so fast um which is also crazy because i was talking with rio about this a couple years ago me her and will went to go see in theaters they were doing a double feature of dracula and frankenstein and so we watched them back to back dracula was first and Dracula is only four minutes longer than this movie. It feels like an eternity. Dracula moves yeah. so slow. It yeah. is it is lethargic. Um, and this movie, I don't know, like it it's it feels seventy minutes. It feels its yeah. runtime. It kind of gets in, it gets out. Um, I'm always shocked to come back to this and remember that there's just there's never any discussion that Frankenstein created the monster like the villagers are never like you did this like they just they all form a mob together and they're like let's go get him and there's never that moment of like hey is this your fault yeah yeah and I always like in my brain there always is I like I yeah. just after watching so many other Frankenstein stories in my life that comes up a lot and it just isn't in this one yeah strange yeah I don't know it's kind of an odd Frankenstein story like it, it just feels so sparse to me totally like I mean it's great and I think it works for what it is and it's doing what it's trying to do well but it's just like I leave this being like that's it like yeah. that's your take on Frankenstein is just that guy creates monster monster escapes monster kills girl like yeah it's mob kills monster I'm like it's just it, I guess it's just surprising just how yeah straightforward it is and then even having the happy ending at the end i'm just like wow okay like mm-hmm. is it just it feels like it was so easy <laughs> yeah in a lot of and ways it's like it's just kind of i don't know like it's not like i was like expecting some sort of like subversive masterpiece but i was just like wow like i'm just really surprised at how simple it is yeah it's very because i feel down. like so often it's like well the movies that change everything are movies that are complex and yeah. challenge people and are interesting and this movie was just like the people yearned for a simple kill the monster story. But also it's not that simple because the monster is sympathetic. Yeah. And like, that's what, you know, Robert Foley, I think was his name. Like that mm-hmm. was his original take on the monster was just, it's a simple killing machine. It yeah. just wants to kill. It doesn't have, we don't have any sympathy for it. So it is like, but even that I go, well, the sympathy for the creature is from the novel. Mm-hmm. So it's just, I don't know. It was just so yeah interesting uh, in that way where I'm just like, this is just one of those things where it's like, it just did something really well totally just did something really simple really well and spookily enough that it changed everything right you know i just think that's testament to that sometimes you don't have to rewrite the book you can just and obviously there is interesting decisions being made here like you pointed out those interesting jump cuts and the interesting shots Mm -hmm. um that whale brought to this but it is just kind of like sometimes you can just make a movie well and and that can also make big changes it can make big waves you know yeah yeah, very yeah. much so. And like I think I think a big part of that too is that we're still like this is the first 5 years of talkies, you know? Like they're still figuring out how to tell a story with dialogue at all. Cuz before it was so purely visual and those stories of like silent films aren't very complex most of the time. It's very much like boiled down, distilled, simple. And I think a lot of that is still being carried over. One interesting aspect of that, um, as a quick side note, and then I want to keep coming back to what yeah. you're talking about, just like, I always forget too that these early films, uh, there's no music in these. Yeah. They're, they're silent because again, they came from silent films and they didn't have scores for those and those would be incidental music played at the theater. Then those wouldn't be, it would be very rare that something was composed specifically and sent out with a film. Yeah. It would just be like, well, just play whatever your band can play. Um, so yeah, like this and Dracula don't have scores, yeah, which is, it makes them feel 
empty at some times, but also just eerie in others. Like I think I think it can yeah. add to an atmosphere, but yeah, like I didn't even really notice. Yeah, really, until you've pointed it out now. I'm like, well, yeah, of course there wasn't music yeah, there. No but music. Like I didn't I didn't really like think about it as I was watching it. I, right. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, but I agree. I, I do think I think this is very. It is very simple. It's a very simple movie. It's very yeah. stripped down and streamlined. And that is surprising when it has such a, a gargantuan yeah. reputation. I think it's, I also want to say that maybe it's a testament to the design work being done then. Totally. You know, if, and like the performance of Boris Karloff, the performance of Colin Clyde, like if the actual technical craft here and even the writing of it and the full, the overall production is really simple. It obviously wouldn't have had as much of an impact if it wasn't, for you know the really exciting and interesting performances of those two main leads yeah and also the makeup done for the creature like obviously that's the real centerpiece here i totally agree yeah yeah good good observation i'm glad you brought that up well criteria let's do the criteria let's do our collection of criteria okay i have i have lots to say uh (laughs) so so this first one uh historical and technical relevance yeah. More often than not, we land on Kane getting the point because it's yeah. Citizen Kane. I am I am digging my heels and I'm going to argue. <laughs> I think Frankenstein gets this point. I think that every instance of a mad scientist lab comes from this movie. Every mm-hmm. instance of a Frankenstein monster comes back to this movie. The fact that he is green is from this movie. It's green makeup that showed better in black and white. And that is the only reason. Frankenstein's monster is green on the cereal box or whatever else. Like it's, I, I I didn't even have to look up the Simpsons. They've like, (laughs) they, they have done Frankenstein is a character on the Simpsons. This particular design of Frankenstein shows up on the Simpsons. There was an entire movie that parodied this as well Mm -hmm. and could do it well enough that, you know, people knew it. Yeah. Like I just, I think that sure. Like, Technical relevance, yeah. Citizen Kane is pioneering filmmaking, a hundred percent. It's doing things that this movie isn't but doing with this camera story movie. Cre- I love that you were so ready to dig your heels in, as if I was going to be like, "Well, look that that book <laughs> that book's gotten to you." All right, I've had to fight harder. <laughs> no, I think that's totally fair because what we say is usually we give the point to the other movie mm-hmm. if it either matches Kane or tops it, right? I think this is a movie that very much has in so much of a historical impact on horror and on the concepts of like Frankenstein's monster, a lab, like you said, like, no, I think it's absolutely fair to say that this takes the point over Kane. Yeah. Because we so, because again, obviously technical relevance. Yes, we know Citizen Kane did that, mm-hmm. but Frankenstein that so, shaped, that shaped a ton in our culture totally. just generally. And like, I would argue that every movie that has come out since this, even if it's doing something different with like the concept of the Frankenstein's monster, yeah. is still indebted to this original cinematic version more so than anything else, more yeah. so than even the novel itself. It is riffing off of the popular conception of the monster, yeah. which is this movie. And that's just how it happened. That's just the way it went. Right. I mean, even in recent memory, like Lisa Frankenstein is riffing on this movie. It's not riffing on the novel. It's riffing on this movie. Yeah. And yeah, I just think that's something that I don't think we've covered yet on this podcast of something that is so purely monolithic in this level of influence. I don't know that we've talked about anything else that reaches this. Monolithic in this level of influence. Um, I mean, Titanic. Yeah, yeah, I could see Titanic. I mean, that's a, that's I a mean, good argument. That's, I, could, I mean, I that, could that movie Titanic. has overtaken the actual historical event. As sure. This is when you say Titanic. Yeah. People think of that movie, right? Totally. But I would say that's maybe the only one. Yeah, looking back through the list, like I, that that's a good poll. Titanic, I could absolutely stand behind. Jaws kind of Jaws maybe. In, invented and then took over the shark movie. <laughs> sure, sure. And no movie, they've never made a shark movie that isn't entirely indebted to Jaws. But that's yeah. another horror thing, right? Of right. Like, yeah. So like I, the, Titanic's a very good point of like, I think as the years continue onward, Titanic is going to keep reaching this level. And like, what surprises me about the stuff that we're talking about is just 
part of it is influence, a part of it is longevity of just, this was made in 1931 and it is still, again, like this year we got a movie riffing on this. That, that's almost, surprising to me. It is, And I am positive that Del Toro's will do some sort of, if of not, course. you know, if not like borrowing images from this, because I trust, I trust that he will have yeah. his own take. He'll have things to do. But he is such a fan of, if you are a fan of cinema and you are making a Frankenstein film, you're you're gonna reference this. I'm pretty this sure is... this and Bride are in his like top ten that he's listed. To people oh, I'm sure the they time. are. Like it's got a monster movies. in it that it's sympathetic. Is sympathetic. <laughs> Del Toro, there you go. <laughs> Made a career off it. <laughs> yeah. So I come back around. I I fully agree. Uh, yeah. I think this point goes to Frankenstein. This point goes to Frankenstein. How well is this movie doing what it's trying to do? And let's try and keep in mind for the time for the as time. well as today. Sure. Today, sure, sure. obviously, this does not scare me. No. I am not afraid. I don't find it challenging or surprising or no. You know, really blasphemous or anything. Yeah. But obviously, from what we know at the time, super effective. Very much so. Did what it was doing so well that they made a billion more of these. Yeah. Like they they invented the first franchise off of these characters yeah film history like yeah yeah. at the time i think it absolutely did what it was trying to do yeah so i should we give the point to but is it doing what it's trying to do better than kane you you're more the authority on this than i am okay well so what it's doing was better received Mm -hmm. but is also more simple yeah it's easier to get people to like this. It's a lower bar to clear. It's a lower bar to clear because this is a scary movie. Totally. And your main goal is to scare people. Whereas Citizen Kane is asking people to actively consider, you know, the tycoons in their world yeah. and consider what makes that person like that. Like that was just a very like politically charged movie in a way. Totally. And so I don't know. Um, hmm. I will say that what Citizen Kane is trying to do is I can interact with in the exact same way that people did at the time today. Mm. In that it's doing what it's trying to do well enough that even today someone can watch it and still interact with it and get the same emotional feeling that people then could, I would say. Yeah. Whereas Frankenstein is not just by nature of the genre and by nature of how our culture has progressed, Frankenstein does not have that longevity to it. No. So I'm willing to give Kane this point because it feels more timeless in that way. Mm -hmm. It holds up better today than Frankenstein does. Yeah. So maybe, but again, fully recognizing that Frank, what Frankenstein did at the time absolutely worked. But I think that potentially as a work of art, Kane is doing what it's trying to do better because it it was made in such a way that it can be timeless. Sure. Sort of, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I I know, that's you. my I argument. I, I can get behind that argument 100%. Okay, so yeah. we'll give that point to Kane. Point to Kane. Mm-hmm. Okay. You like this movie more than you like Citizen Kane. Yes, I do. I like this movie less than I like Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What do you... What do you I, is that this entire point and criteria or do you have anything else to say? I mean, this is one of those that has the unfair advantage of being seasonal. You know what I mean? Yeah, like my true. run from September, to October, I'm much more inclined to be like, yeah, I'll toss this on in my rotation of Halloween yeah. movies. Um, Kane doesn't have that. Kane is a yeah. seasonal movie and it doesn't slot in that same way for me. Um, you know what? For, for my own sake, because I, I have thoughts on the taking a step back portion in just a moment. For my own sake, I personally am going to give the point uh, to Frankenstein. I, yeah. I like this. I connect with this movie more. Yeah. Just because I like I would, the imagery. I would argue that it is probably more watchable because it's 70 minutes <laughs> yeah it's it is <laughs> you a can throw this movie. on and it is not a commitment no. and you are just like this is again it's easy yeah it's an easy movie and that's not a bad thing no and i, I don't think say like, that i don't say that derogatory you no, know but that's it's it's 
it's what we've run into throughout all of film history, especially with like the Academy, is that that is what they toss around. Like, well, these movies are simple. There's yeah. nothing going under the hood. They're not complex. It's like, yeah, well, they are. They're just not complex in the same ways. I, I mean, I was almost about to be like, wait, roller coaster movies. Wait, do we need to do we need to reiterate <laughs> Scorsese's war against? No, it's fine. We don't need it's to fine. do that right now. I got you know we're fine. We can't get into it all. <laughs> can't get into it all. Um, we're simple yeah, men. I agree. <laughs> we're just normal men. We're just normal men. Um, I. I'm also going to give this to Frankenstein. Really? I feel like I I mean, I don't find it as interesting as I do Citizen Kane. I sure. think Citizen Kane is one that I would more readily be like, oh, I'm very interested in like going back to that and kind of, you know, yeah. ever since I bought it at the mm. Criterion sale because they didn't have the ones I wanted to buy. Um, and I felt like I should own this. Um, I have been wanting to be like, I want to throw on like the behind the scenes on that. You sure. know, the Criterion Blu-ray, I want to watch this again. Like, I'm inter- I, you know, I finished that book about it. But I will say that just like, yeah, generally speaking, I think Frankenstein is something that I, I don't know, I can watch it again. Sure. Uh, but the question is my emotional connection, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that is the question. It's not just what movie would you watch again? <laughs> we can we can be divided on um, these criteria. As yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't love this. I think I'm more interested in returning to the bride of Frankenstein mm. that it from memory that felt more interesting to me, but maybe I'm misremembering. I'd be interested to rewatch. Most, most superior. people consider it superior. Most people yeah. list that as like one of the better sequels made. Yeah. Like I just feel like with that one, I'm, it takes I mean, the, everything that works in here and adds more interesting stuff. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where I'm at. So yeah, I'll give this point to Kane okay. right now, but with a, with, you know, a strong, Hey, Frankenstein did what it did really well, and I liked it. Totally, you know? totally. I enjoyed it. Um, so, objective, taking, a step, taking back. a step back. How are we feeling? Mm, okay, well, so for me, it's two to one, Kane. Yeah, and me, it's um, two to one, Frankenstein. Ah, uh, that's hard, Parker. That's really tricky for me. Yeah, because I don't think Frankenstein is a better movie. Mm-hmm. I think it just had a huge impact on culture. Sure. Honestly, for me, maybe it's not that tricky. You know, maybe I've already answered the question. <laughs> because for me, I think that the story of Frankenstein, like the novel by Mary Shelley, I think is really interesting. And I have yet to see a version of it that I really think matches what I feel that story has in it. Sure. And I think for me, I don't have a nostalgic connection to this movie in the way that people do who saw it younger or people who are older. Mm -hmm. Like I don't really hold it in a super high regard. Yeah. And I think that its impact on our culture is massive, but also I'm like, well, it's kind of a bummer that this is the only like publicly understood version of the creature when it's very different from what Shelley's intentions were Mm -hmm. almost, you know, like the creature there is, different than this version and i feel that it is kind of like on one hand i'm like that's great and i really love that this movie managed to make that much of an impact but i'm also like well i do think that it would be it would have been interesting to see if this hadn't had such like a a chokehold on like the public's concept of what the creature is yeah i don't know that's kind of where i'm at so i'm like i like this movie but i'm also like I think that what it contributed is significant. And I think it's a huge win that this took the the historical and technical relevance point away from Kane. I think that's massive. And so I think setting it, like making sure that I specify that that point is huge. And I do think this movie, you know, gives Kane a run for its money in cultural relevance and historical relevance. I do think that Kane is a better movie than this. Yeah. And that's where I'm at. I can get behind that. I, I think I like this movie a lot. But if I am objectively taking a look at, like, what is the better movie, removing the pop culture-ness of it all, yeah, Citizen Kane is a better movie than this, 100%. Um, and to your point about, like, as a as a fan of the book myself, like, the distinction I've always made in my head to, like, hold space for appreciating this is that I have yet to see a depiction of mary shelley's the creature that i want 
Yes. I fully think this is Frankenstein. Like Absolutely. this character is Frankenstein. Oh, you know? yeah. No, and this like is that, a great and like that, disti- that distinction helps me a lot where I'm just like, this isn't even remotely the character that she wrote. And right. I'm fine with that because it is yeah. entirely its own thing at this point. It's its I own do, thing. I, I, I wish that, and I feel like most people do. Like when I talk to just general people about Frankenstein, I think a lot of people are under the understanding that like our pop culture version of it isn't what the novel is at all. Like, I think people are very aware of that. People aren't aware what the novel is, but they know it isn't this, right? Right. And in a perfect world, I wish that we had gotten a bit more of, like, a, a, you know, cultural acknowledgement of Shelley's specific version. But I do think that, like, this character as it exists is its own kind of thing, and I can kind of let that lie. It's like, okay, this is capital F Frankenstein. I I do want to say that I agree with you. In me bringing up these points, it wasn't me trying to trash the movie. I hope it didn't come across that way. Max, you don't need to apologize. Um, it's better. It's it's better. Just stick to your guns. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to say that I think something that this movie does is lay out a great track of sequels that I think Kane really could have taken advantage of. I think that Citizen <laughs> Kane could have come out, and then we could have had Bride of Kane, Son of Kane. Son of Cain, Ghost of Cain. Ghost of Cain. I think is good. I think that Citizen Kane meets Cain the Wolfman. Meets the Wolfman. <laughs> would have been really. Abbott and been... Costello meet House, Cain. House of Citizen Cain. And then its sequel, House of Rosebud. I don't know. What's the Dracula equivalent? Um, and then, of course, later, kind of wrapping Gettys. it all up. House is... of Gettys. Yeah, House of Gettys. <laughs> he can have his own spin off. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, it all wraps up, like you said, with um, Abbott and Costello meet Citizen Kane. <laughs> I'd watch. I, ju- I, I just think that there's this there's this <laughs> can't even commit to this bit. <laughs> there's this untapped potential that they missed in the 40s for Citizen Kane sequels. And I just think that Frankenstein laid out the perfect track for it. Right. You know. Uh, so my follow up question is, um, by the time we get to Abbott and Costello meet Citizen Kane, is it wine commercial orson wells is it very large lethargic <laughs> it, well it, i mean abbott and Costello came out in what 48 which is right only but if we're, 17... if we're going if we're going like the, the the 20 years gap of this if, if if we're if we're taking this and applying it straight to kane well but i mean 20 years the 20 years gap it wouldn't quite be to that point yet it would I be more so. it would be more you know 17 years is closer to touch of evil um okay, orson right. wells um who, you know, is like in his 40s. Yeah. <laughs> but what's hard is that, ah, uh, see, we're discussing the merits of sequels to Citizen Kane. <laughs> That's when we know we've lost I was just going to say, I was plot. like, well, but see, the movie ends with him being yeah, old. The, the so thre- are these the interquals. Lost. Uh, and I guess this is what studios ran into when they tried to pitch Bride of Citizen Kane, Son of Citizen Kane. I think yeah. Ghost of Citizen Kane had some real potential. I think That's so. Okay. You should get on that. Oh, should I get on you that? You should get on that. I should get on that. Yeah. Yeah. But should it be like, I don't know. Anyway, it should be like a bit 50s B movie. Just Why like, not? well, who would have made it? Corman would have just made sequels to Kane. Hey, Wells it worked made... for George Lucas. You're right. Yeah. Always You're make right. a, 50, a 50s B movie. People <laughs> will love it. Uh, all right. So uh, do you want to say it or should I say it or how should we wrap this up? I, I can I can say it. Okay. Frankenstein is not better than Citizen Kane. And should we should we add like a little buzzer that goes off when we say that? Sure, why not? And when we and when <laughs> I love right. you're just adding things to my workload. It's like so, so what, what should we add to this in post? Parker, should we also add like if, if a movie is better than Citizen Kane, it's like just this, the audio of Kane standing and clapping for longer than everyone else? Sure, yeah. Just adds an extra like minute to the runtime. I think Does that so. sound okay? Are you are you writing this down? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Furiously. Uh, Parker and I like each other, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know why this is always um, a question for you. <laughs> because you just <laughs> said everything you said. No, you're fine. Um, uh, what are we doing next time, Max? Thanks for everyone to... What? Thanks what to did... everyone who listened this yeah. week. Next week, Parker said it earlier. Mm-hmm. Nosferatu, 1922. 
F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu. Just in time for Robert Eggers' Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. I was going to say that we chose Frankenstein just kind of like because of its status as kind of what shaped this era in cinema. Yeah. But it is kind of like, oh, well, I mean, Frankenstein's getting kind of an adaptation again next year from Del mm-hmm. Toro, who we just covered last week. And then next week we're doing Nosferatu and there's another Nosferatu coming out this year. And that does that happens once every 50 years. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, Very exciting. Very exciting. It's a good time to like those two guys, Frankenstein mm-hmm. and Nosferatu. And uh, so, yeah, thanks to everybody for listening. Thank you so much. And if any of you happen to work at Universal, just a reminder, put me in touch with James Wan. I would love to talk more about spooky little sidekick for the creature from the Black Lagoon. He can be animated or he can be hot. Those are my two pitches. I think it's right necessary. Now. Maybe he's both. Maybe he's could be hot and animated. We have a plethora of those. <sighs> thanks that's everyone. interesting that's an interesting thing all right yeah thanks everybody <laughs> <laughs> take care bye